Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Alexander. I'm uh, head of research at uh, Concord Capital. I have about 15 uh, year experience in uh, equity evaluation. And uh, here I am, I'm going to just present uh, some abstracts uh, which uh, maybe are ignored somehow in valuation approach. Uh, just to drag your attention how uh, valuation can be improved, uh, how valuation can uh, be more reliable. Uh, last year, uh, it, at the same workshop, uh, it was uh, an interesting uh, presentation uh, asking uh, the question whether valuation is science, craft or art. Um, I was thinking uh, a lot about that and I concluded that uh, valuation is uh, not a science, it's uh, more craft and uh, it's also uh, art. Uh, art because uh, as an artist, a uh, researcher can be, uh, should be uh, convincing. Uh, if, uh, for example, an actor is not convincing, he will lose his job. Uh, the same, uh, I believe, uh, could be applied to uh, equity researcher. And, uh, Re equity research is also craft because uh, as a craftsman you use uh, some tools to uh, create some product and uh, as in a craft if you apply to that product uh, some wrong details this product just won't work and uh, the same can be said about valuation report if this report is not uh, convincing because of some uh, wrong details, you won't sell it. it, it just will not work. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, three different which, uh, topics which are not related to each other, uh, but all they have uh, important implications for evaluation outcome. Uh, let's start with uh, terminal value. Uh, as you know, uh, most, uh, most of free cash flow models, uh, in doing uh, any free cash flow model, a researcher uh, do uh, explicitly separate the forecasting period for any assets in, into two periods. The first is uh, the so-called explicitly forecasted period. Uh, usually it's five, eight, or ten years. And the rest is the so-called tail. Yeah, so nobody cares about it. It doesn't matter what, what's going on with the company in like 10 or 15 or 25 years. And it is considered as terminal value, as a tail value, and so on. Uh, but uh, from uh, my experience, from experience of my colleagues, uh, I can claim that usually in, uh, in the model, uh, the terminal value accounts for more than 50% of total value. So it, it, it cannot be ignored. And unfortunately, uh, and it's not only uh, it's also from my experience, yeah, uh, analysts uh, spent too little time uh, to uh, modeling terminal value to providing terminal assumptions. And that's the problem. Oh, <coughs> coming back to two periods, uh, uh, if you uh, model uh, the companies or any assets uh, development for the next year, uh, for the second year or for the tenth year, uh, you might have a lot of information, historical information about business of that company, 
uh, you uh, might have good knowledge of the industry you cover, uh, the company you cover, or, or any other asset you cover, and you can provide good market research, do some porter's power, uh, some other stuff, you can analyze competitors, you can analyze uh, the target companies, uh, investment plans, growth plans, uh, marketing plans, and you can uh, generate some good and very good uh, motivated uh, forecasts of uh, revenue, profits, free cash flow, and so on. And uh, yeah, you usually use 99% of time to explain what is the market, what are the prospects, uh, who are the competitors, what is the company future. But uh, of course, uh, uh, the next, each next year you are forecasting, it has, um, it rests on increasingly more assumptions that you have to apply. So, uh, if you can easily forecast some key parameters for the first year, for the tenth year it's much more higher to forecast and uh, it's much more hard to trust in your assumptions. And then, after you forecast, uh, explicitly forecasted period finishes, then goes the terminal value. In terminal value, you usually uh, analysts use uh, two, um, two methods to uh, calculate it. The first is just some exit or terminal multiple, and another is some, um, the, uh, some, <coughs> uh, some version of uh, infinite uh, or finite uh, geometric, geometrical regression, uh, which is usually called Gordon Gross model. And uh, for terminal valuation, uh, your knowledge about the sector, your knowledge about the company doesn't matter anymore because it's very, very long-term future. And what becomes increasingly important when we are talking about long-term future is some logics, some good assumptions, some good uh, approach, technology, methodologies that you use. And uh, the, the, key, the key thing uh, to remain convincing uh, why, uh, while coming from explicitly forecasted period to terminal value, to terminal period is uh, logics and common sense. Uh, <coughs> this is, by the way, the abstract of uh, uh, a presentation from the last year uh, evaluation workshop uh, where uh, the authors uh, cite uh, Professor Charles Lee uh, who claims that in, even in mature sectors which do not uh, demand huge investments, terminal value represents 56% of total present value in fast-growing sectors, in emerging sectors, terminal value is uh, accounts for more than uh, 100%. Uh, we can easily prove this on uh, just doing simple mathematical modeling. Uh, I just uh, use a very, a very simple model. I start from some positive cash flow in the year zero. Uh, Assume that there is some explicit, uh, the some growth rate for the year one, uh, first to ninth. It, it's like from zero to six. There is a terminal growth which is uh, usually uh, fixed at two percent, and there is some discount factor. Uh, so very simple model. Uh, the growth is uh, the same in the year one to nine, and the same in the uh, next year, to, uh, which is two percent. And you see that this simple model shows that terminal value, this 10 plus year, explains at least 38% of total value, and uh, uh, sorry, at least uh, 32 and uh, up to uh, 50, uh, 64. 
uh, but it's ideal case. Uh, usually in uh, real modeling, uh, terminal value accounts uh, for much bigger portion just because uh, any company that you uh, that you study has a pretty uh, intensive capex plan for the next couple of years that they can justify uh, that uh, they have a lot of interest in projects uh, and usually you include this huge capex in, in into the forecast of cash flow for the nearest periods and this uh, decreases the share of uh, value of uh, explicitly forecasted period into your total value contribution. So, uh, uh, statistics, uh, st statisticians say that uh, the, the tail is something that uh, that has probability of less than 10 or less than 5 percent, uh, depending on their approach. Yeah, and uh, in valuation, in valuation, we uh, we cannot say that this tail, this uh, uh, terminal period, this terminal value can be just considered as a tail because is it, it explains a lot. It explains a lot of uh, value which you calculated. You again. You do not do research about this tail period. You do research only about uh, like uh, the first five or ten years, but a lot of value is explained by the period which you just do not cover. And uh, if you uh, specify this terminal value, this terminal pe period uh, incorrectly, you can have some problems. Uh, first, for the first problem, you uh, can uh, can become not convincing anymore. As the second problem, you will uh, underestimate or overestimate the total value of the assets uh, that you are trying to research. And uh, uh, just to uh, explain why it is important. Uh, to model uh, uh, to model cash flow not only for the like first year of your forecast or for second year of your forecast, you should keep in mind that this terminal value terminal period uh, uh, starts uh, not in 50 years or 100 years. It uh, starts just the next year when you stop forecasting cash flow of your company. Uh, why it is important? Uh, this is a real life example. It's a um, valuation DCF model uh, of one uh, multinational company, uh, which by the way was covered by our uh, teams in uh, CFA Research Challenge a couple of years ago. And uh, this model uh, has been done by a uh, very reputable international investment bank. Uh, as you see, terminal value accounts for 62% of total value of that company. And uh, if you look at that number, I have a question. How correctly was this terminal value specified? How the researcher came uh, to that terminal value. And uh, just to check uh, whether uh, the researcher used realistic assumption, I was trying to visualize some of parameters of that model. And what can I see? Uh, it's it's good thing to assume that uh, by the end of forecasting period, Capital expenditures and depreciation and amortization, they become an equal. Uh, that's that standard approach, it's okay. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have other, so we, we can uh, exclude uh, depreciation and capex because they are killing each other. 
but we have two other parameters, net operating profit and uh, investments in working capital, which will matter in the future and will define the terminal value. And what we see that in the very last year of forecasting period, for some reason, working capital investment change going up. It, ne it never has been before. And what, what's also strange that terminal value, which starts here in the year 10, it, the growth of any parameter differs significantly from growth, which is pointed here in the last years of forecasted years. So my conclusion, I don't trust this model. I don't trust this model because if I put myself into the year nine, and if I believe that the company which was growing five or six percent uh, all the life, will start growing at two percent, which is terminal growth value, uh, I will probably believe that the company worth nothing. So there should be some transitional period at least. And <coughs> this is uh, the, the ultimate outcome of uh, DCF model. Uh, I mean, it's forecasted free cash flow to firm. And we see again that in the year nine, it's growing at 9% rate and it never grew uh, below 3%. But from the year 10, it starts growing and for indefinite, it starts growing at 2% rate. I don't believe this model. Um, what, uh, how can we improve this model? How, how can we improve uh, the assumptions to make this uh, picture better or closer to reality? Any ideas? Uh, yes, it's, yeah, it's easy. Uh, usually, usually, uh, researchers use some transition period, just uh, add some, like two, three, or five years to model, and to make this pattern much more convincing. Yeah, now the terminal level starts here. We have some transition smoothening period, and um, I'm okay with that. I I like this approach it looks much more convincing. It looks much more like an art here. And what are the outcomes? Uh, what are the outcomes of adding this smoothening period? Uh, first, uh, first of all, just from that picture, I, I'm sure that uh, the assumptions, long-term assumptions are more credible because I explicitly modeled how the company will come from 9% growth to 2% growth, yeah? So I did leave that life with the company to, to see how that can happen from nine to two to this indefinite period. Uh, another good outcome for me is that uh, the terminal value, share of terminal value decreases from 62% to 42% because we just added a couple of years. And uh, another outcome, but from this particular uh, case is that value value is 8% uh, eight, higher for that company, the DCF implied value. And it even changed, it changes the recommendation because implied upside in the original uh, paper was 3.2%. Uh, implying hold recommendation. The new upside, if you add this number, is 11.8%, which, uh, which implies a buy recommendation according to the policy of that company. Oh, so it was just a simple illustration, um, and uh, I just want to summarize. Yeah, uh, if you want to improve credibility of your model, uh, just try uh, to uh, and uh, just try to extend your model to uh, bring all the cash flow parameters, all the uh, growth rates of your key cash flow parameters to your terminal growth, and you even may uh, uh, arrive to um, 
completely different uh, conclusions that you uh, had before you doing this smoothening. And uh, another thing, tried, uh, tried to visualize all the, uh, all the parameters, especially cash flow parameters that you model and that you are including in uh, DCF. Because if there is some volatility of, uh, I don't know, capex or uh, working capital in, the, in your first or second forecasting year, you can explain it. If there is huge volatility in the very last year, it's uh, uh, first of all you cannot explain it, and uh, I suspect that there could be some manipulations that you used to to bring some other parameters um, in line with I don't know what. Oh, this is the first part. Uh, the second the second uh, topic that I want to discuss it's. Uh, I think uh, I might be contrarian with that topic uh, with uh, some uh, common knowledge or uh, your experience, but at least try to listen to me. Um, so uh, DCF and multiples or uh, peer valuation or relative valuation are two uh, commonly used um, methods to uh, value any company. Uh, uh, Jack Gorsch already uh, uh, told uh, about uh, application of these two uh, models, but on general view, and uh, here I will try just to bring uh, you ideas when uh, it is appropriate to use uh, DCF or when it is appropriate to use uh, market multiples to bring uh, to uh, to good uh, evaluation result, to convincing evaluation results. Of course, uh, market multiples uh, are considered are considered to be uh, easier to do. Uh, they are more intuitive. They uh, are considered to uh, just uh, uh, capture some uh, fresh market sentiments. Yeah, for example. Uh, if we are talking about uh, real estate or uh, f residential real estate, uh, if we see that uh, price of square meter in uh, Kiev is growing, so we apply this multiple and we are comfortable with that. Uh, but uh, <coughs> multiples uh, or peer valuation uh, has a lot of uh, problems. Uh, the first uh, and the deepest uh, problem is uh, the data that you use for multiple valuation. It either uh, comes from different sources. For example, you, you want to estimate value of some company that you know very well. You use for a casted uh, EBITDA or revenue parameter of that company. And uh, after that, you some, uh, find somewhere multiples for other companies. And you uh, usually, you may even not know what is the quality of that forecast uh, uh, based on which these multiples were calculated. Uh, on the other side, if you are a huge research house, like some multinational investment company, you may uh, have uh, forecast your own in-house financial forecast for all the peers and you can use forecast financial forecast for all your peers uh, all the peers of your covered company to estimate uh, forward-looking multiples for all the sector but it becomes too uh, too subjective so you do not use uh, uh, so you just rely in all the calculations on on, uh, only on your in-house research. Uh, <coughs> of course, uh, multiples uh, or relative valuation depends on the uh, peers that you choose, on uh, the uh <coughs> uh, ratios that you decide to use, 
and even on uh, statistics that you decide to use, whether it's uh, like average or median or ge geometric mean or anything else. And the result can uh, vary significantly uh, depending on what you use. So it's again subjective. Uh, <coughs> uh, next, next problem um, of uh, peer evaluation is that it implicitly assumes that your company is not unique. Your company should be valid as the average company. And uh, more, more, uh, more or less, you, uh, you have no clue, uh, based on this uh, evaluation approach, when, when your company should be valued as an average sector company. Of course, if you believe that it should be on a uh, 12 months horizon, it's okay, but uh, you still have to prove it. And uh, the, the last uh, is um, peer evaluation usually has very poor explanatory power if uh, your company is different from the sector, if it has some things, uh, very peculiar things that uh, are not present in other companies. So uh, especially if it has some plans which can be uh, quantified uh, in the midterm, if the company has very good growth program, investment program, and other companies do not, so your multiples, uh, your uh, peer valuation can become uh, a bit useless. Um, so uh, uh, next next question is so okay. Uh, you you wasn't uh, so you weren't lazy. You did both peer evaluation and uh, DCF, and uh, you have this is like theoretical example uh, such strange thing that your DCF provides like four and a half uh, well uh, units value per share. Some of your multiples provide uh, ten and a half implied value per share and some other multiple multiples again provide four and a half uh, units value per share. Uh, the most uh, easy approach is just to make some average of all this uh, that you see. Yeah? Uh, for example, use the average of all four multiples and then use average of this DCF uh, implied price and of er average of multiples, so you will have such target. Um, <coughs> as uh, Jagosh, by the way, said, so uh, by averaging, it's, it's not a good idea, yeah? And you see that uh, by setting the target price as an average of average of average, you, you just uh, arrive to some target which, is, which cannot be explained by anything. Neither matrix, neither matrix point at this target. Uh, therefore, uh, in such cases, uh, first of all, it's it's very good to visualize your like key outcomes, yeah. And from that picture, uh, you can say that your DCF implied price is pretty close to the prices implied by EV sales multiple and TV bidder multiple. So why not to use this price? For me, it looks like, on the picture, it looks much better than, than that price. And uh, so my, <coughs> my advice, yeah, if, if you have some uh, wide range of implied prices by peer valuation, and you have DCF implied price, you can always explain why your DCF implied price should be correct. So if, if DCF implied price would be here and here, I think you would be able to explain why it is a good tool to uh, estimate fair value of this company. Uh, so you just, in this case, you just can explain that this multiple is, for some reason, is not correct, and this multiple is 
not not very applicable for example because most of the companies in this sector are loss making and p uh, has been selected for little companies uh, so uh, my conclusion of that section is uh, uh, you should maybe not should uh, <coughs> i just advise you to not mix uh, multiple implied prices and DCF implied prices to uh, arrive to your target price. Uh, DCF uh, is what uh, is, the, uh, is the outcome uh, for which you spend a lot of time, a lot of efforts uh, studying the company, the industry and so on. So in my opinion, if you did a good job, if you uh, collected enough information, if you have enough information to uh, do realistic assumptions about the future of the company, of the industry, if um, everything is more or less certain in the industry, it's not about new industries, of course, uh, I think that uh, you should better stick to your DCF model. Uh, important thing is that uh, uh, the uh, application, applicability of your DCF model depends on uh, your ability to convince uh, your client that uh, all, all the job that you have done to run the DCF model was good job. This is about details and so on. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in ideal case, what I uh, described on that slide, uh, your DCF based valuation should be confirmed by some of uh, peer valuation that uh, that will significantly improve reliability of your uh, conclusion and uh, yes yeah, there are some cases where uh, uh, peer valuation is uh, impossible to to do because the company is so unique or the sector is so unique so you, ha you will have no other choice but to run DCF model and uh, base your target price on DCF in that case. Uh, about uh, peer valuation, of course there are a lot of cases when peer valuation is more applicable, more intuitive and so on. Uh, if there is some rule of thumb uh, metric that uh, is used by everywhere in that industry, for example, if uh, uh, Ukrainian, uh, like Land Bank of Ukrainian farming company is valued at, uh, let's say, 1.2 thousand uh, uh, dollars per hectare. It's good multiple, yeah? Uh, uh, of course, uh, yeah, you can easily use relative valuation if uh, the, your company is not unique. Uh, for example, it's one of 25 uh, Obel Energos in Ukraine or it's uh, one of uh, like <coughs> some big four companies for, from whatever sector you, you can uh, use the multiples of other three companies. Uh, and uh, the, the, last, the last thing uh, when uh, you can, uh, the last case when you can rely more on uh, relative valuation is uh, when uh, you believe that your DCF approach, your modeling, uh, all your efforts you do before are not convincing, which is actually not good for you, in my opinion. And uh, <coughs> another, uh, another fragment that uh, I want to draw your attention on uh, is uh, how to calculate the 12 months target price. Uh, it's actually not that easy question because uh, usually uh, our uh, researchers and even our teams which do uh, a research challenge uh, usually use two different, in my opinion, very different approaches to calculate target 12 months target price of uh, any company they cover. Uh, the, first, uh, the first approach is uh, you, if you are like in the year 2019, uh, you ignore all the cash flow of the year 2019 
do not discount them and start uh, discount uh, put yourself in uh, February 15th of 2020 and discount all all the cash flow uh, starting from 2020 to February 15th of 2020 and uh, have some uh, <coughs> NPV of all the future cash flow then uh, decrease this NPV of future cash flow by uh, net debt, uh, which you believe will be in one year in that company, and you will arrive at fair equity value or DCF-based equity value of that company. Another approach uh, used is to calculate equity, uh, fair equity value, so-called fair equity value as of today, by discounting everything that uh, that the company will generate starting from today, then uh, subtract the, uh, that NPV by uh, net debt as of today uh, to get some <coughs> um, intermediate equity value as of today and then to compound it into 12 months to multiply it by one of cost of equity for uh, one plus cost of equity. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this this approach has some problems, uh, which we'll, I will show on the next slide. Uh, but uh, you should understand that these two approaches are not identical. They do not provide an identical results. To make results of these two approaches identical, you have to have four very, uh, I would say, strong assumptions. The first is that weighted average cost of capi capital that you use is uh, always equal to cost of equity. Uh, that no dividends, that no, no other corporate, corporate actions are happening uh, in the next 12 months. And no change in uh, total debt, gross debt uh, of your covered company will happen in the next 12 months. Surely this three assumptions, uh, they, uh, um, they are easy to believe, yeah, but the next, the next assumption is very critical th and it, it cannot be imagined, controlled or so on. So the, the, the last assumption is this, these two prices are identical only if today's net debt that the company has is zero. Uh, let me try to prove this. Oh. So <coughs> here, uh, yeah, so, some math. Uh, uh, here uh, on the bottom we have uh, the simple formula to calculate uh, DCF or DCF implied value of a company in in the time t1 t uh, today's pl uh, today plus one year. It's NPV of all the cash flow from period two to uh, infinity at the time T1 minus net debt, which you forecast uh, to be uh, this company to have in, in one year. Uh, another approach is to calculate value as of today, uh, the discounted value as of today, and multiply it by one plus cost of equity and let's assume cost of equity is equal to weighted average cost of capital uh, which uh, which will have the same uh, the following form it's NPV of year 2 plus in indefinite like here but in the time uh, as of today in the time zero multiplied by so, uh, 1 plus equity is this multiplier cash flow of the first year again multiplied by 1 plus cost of equity and discounted by 1 plus weighted average cost of capital because we should bring it, uh, should calculate NPV of this cash flow as of today. Minus net debt as of today also multiplied by 1 plus cost of equity which is very strange. So you are multiplying debt by cost of equity but okay. <coughs> So let's, uh, let's see the difference between these two approaches. Uh, let's start from the bottom. So we see that, uh, so 
as we assume there is no, no new debt, no dividends, so all the cash flow generated by this company in the, in the first year, they will decrease net debt uh, compared to uh, the today, yeah, and uh, so the net debt of the year one can be uh, <coughs> calculated as net debt as of today mi minus cash flow if it's positive. Um, and then we, we bring to this formula, so we bring this number here, and uh, we have su such a simple formula, and let's try to derive the upper formula to the comparable, uh, bring it to, to the same uh, numerator. Uh, in the upper formula, this and this uh, is uh, crossing out. It, uh, if if uh, W equals to E, we have CF1. Uh, here, if uh, to go from a time from today to a period in one year, uh, we should uh, divide this by one plus uh, <coughs> weighted average uh, uh, cost of capital. And again, this uh, one plus W and one plus E will uh, will be crossed out because they are equal in our case. And uh, now we come to this formula. And the only difference is here. So if we, uh, if we compare these two numbers, uh, we will have this. So uh, the implied equity value, if you start calculating it today, will be uh, lower then the implied equity value that you will start calculating one year by net debt, today's net debt multiplied by cost of equity. Um, so if you uh, use uh, the approach to start calculating equity value from today and you have your company, your target company has huge debt, you will significantly uh, undervalue uh, this company and vice versa if the company is cash rich you you overestimate its value um, in my opinion uh, the upper formula the upper approach uh, is applicable but only in cases if uh, if you have uh, no idea about the company's uh, balance sheet, uh, meaning you cannot estimate uh, perfectly the company's uh, net debt uh, in on the 12 months horizon, which is a bit strange. Yeah, if you do the DCF model, uh, you should have all the balance sheet parameters. But uh, I think it, it can be applicable uh, definitely if if we add some other uh, okay, it's here. If we add back some other assumption, if there are dividends, if uh, if this equation uh, weighted average cost of capital is not equal to cost of equity, if debt is changing, this formula will be much much longer. So it, the well uh, the difference will be higher. So it's up to you to choose between these two approaches but uh, in my opinion uh, the the second approach at least it allows uh, you to calculate uh, better the company's value when the company is paying dividends when the company's uh, debt is changing uh, which is obvious here yeah, because you usually you forecast some changes and but again it's up to you and uh, i think that's it yeah, that's everything I want to say. Thank you. Okay. No questions, which is good. <laughs> no, we have questions. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so firstly, thanks for the presentation, very useful. Uh, I just would like to um, uh, clarify a bit with regards to 
uh, first part of your presentation, uh, terminal value. So um, sometimes in Ukrainian reality, especially when a uh, firm which we are valuing uh, has all the sales generated here in the country, it might be, uh, well, somewhat a bit forward looking to value, let's say, beyond five year horizons. So uh, in that case, we uh, in ca in applying uh, DCF, we go to the opposite of your recommendation, particularly we not extend but shorten our forecasted period and rely more on terminal value. Just wanted to clarify, given that how can we eliminate this fact or maybe somehow adjust it particularly to Ukrainian cases when we cannot project that long? Uh, I think it's an uh, illusion that um, like Western companies have better forecasts than, for example, Ukrainian companies. Yes, of course, there are some uh, good cases uh, when the companies have some long-term model, uh, they share this model with analysts and so on, but uh, most of companies, for example, in the United States, most of companies are much more closed to uh, investors, to analysts, that, uh, for example, some Ukrainian companies. So uh, I don't uh, don't believe uh, that uh, the problem of uh, lack of information, lack of transparency is uh, usual for Ukraine. Uh, there are some companies in Ukraine which provide, uh, provide pretty good information. And uh, if, if you have, some, for example, information from management for, for the next one or two years, I think uh, it should be enough for you to understand how uh, what the management thinks, uh, how the company could develop. Uh, if you do interview with management, you could understand, uh, learn whether this management is capable of running the company and you can uh, do your conclusion whether, uh, whether it's a good idea to forecast the company's future for five years or for ten years. Uh, but uh, again, if you have, if you believe in only next 10 years uh, of the company's future, uh, you can start uh, smoothening like fr uh, from the year three. It's not a problem because uh, in many cases, uh, researchers use just five year forecasting period, which sometimes should include this smoothening period as well. And it's not a big problem. 